You're listening to Let's Talk Sustainable Business. Hello, my name is Uwe Schulte and it's a pleasure to welcome you to our second podcast in our new series, Let's Talk Sustainable Business. It's brought to you by the Conference Board Global Sustainability Center. Today, I'm welcoming back John Elkington from Volans. In this podcast, we will be discussing his demands for stepping up the corporate sustainability agenda as he has elaborated in his new book, Green Swans. Before we get started, we are recording this podcast in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis and would like to declare our support for those suffering in this crisis and also express our thanks to all health care workers attending the sick at own personal risk and all the workers supporting people at risk and keeping everybody supplied with food and other essential items. So now let me introduce our guest to you. John Elkington is an author, advisor and serial entrepreneur. He's a world authority on corporate sustainability and sustainable development. John introduced in the 90s the concept of the triple bottom line. John is founder and chief pollinator at Volans, co-founder and honorary chairman of sustainability. And if you would like to learn more about John's sustainability journey, I recommend our first podcast in this series. John, welcome back. Thanks, Uva. Thanks very much. And I, I just would like to add my um, support to what you said about healthcare workers and people suffering uh, from COVID-19 around the world. Yeah, this is this is difficult times, and it is interesting that your book, uh, even so, you have written it um, before the crisis broke out. It has so much bearing on it, and let's uh, let's explore that a little bit. But before we uh, do this, um, you made a, a very how should I put strange move. You came up with a concept of the triple bottom line. It's been adopted by many people, by many companies, including your own. And uh, and then, I think it's now almost two years ago, you publicly withdrew and made a public recall. Can you explain that? <laughs> well, you can't uh, recall an idea. It was so it was a provocation uh, uh, more than anything else. And Harvard Business Review, who kindly uh, ran. Uh, the recall said it was the first time anyone had ever recalled a management concept. The reason I did it was very simple. I feel that the triple bottom line works perfectly well if used in the right way, but it's like uh, car companies sometimes recall uh, vehicles because there's some defect. And I think the defect with the triple bottom line is that people uh, basically understood this to be about being more responsible. Whereas for me, always it was that, but it was also about how do you make the system as a whole more sustainable? Not just individual companies, not just their supply chains, but the system as a whole. And, and, and so I broadly, people were very supportive. I had very positive uh, feedback, but then the question is, okay, what next? Yeah, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and f for that, you've assembled a whole flock of birds you know, <laughs> gray, black, green, even blue, and ugly ducklings. Um, I think we should get started at, uh, at least for me, the least likable var variety of swans, the black ones. Um, black swans events uh, were discussed uh, by Nassim Nicholas uh, Taleb in his 2001, I think, book, Fooled by Randomness. And th then he only talked about finance. And later, a few years later, he extended this metaphor to events beyond the financial markets. And I think you've built on that concept. Uh, uh, and um, yeah, um, explain where you're coming from by using black swans. And we'll get back to the green ones, uh, uh, the more hopeful ones a little bit later. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I always admired Nassim Nicholas Taleb's uh, work. And I think when he came up with the book, uh, The Black Swan. It was just before the 2007-2009 crash. So people basically felt he was prophetic and, uh, and so on. Um, again, a financial system uh, issue rather than some of the more broader 
categories that he then uh, moved on to. I was struck by the idea that there are these moments in our history where out of the blue, uh, major crises um, evolve. They have a massive uh, impact, way beyond anything that people are used to. And then unfortunately, and this was the third point that Taleb meant, made, made about uh, black swans, at least as he defined them, uh, we don't actually properly understand what's just happened to us. And therefore, we often set ourselves up uh, for failure next time around. So I, I, I was struck by that. And, and obviously, he meant uh, mainly bad things, but good things. You know, computer technology was a black swan for a lot of the big incumbent um, mainstream computer and IT uh, companies. But I, I've chosen to sort of take black swans as largely uh, things that take us exponentially in uh, directions we don't want to travel, and green swans as um, trajectories or dynamics that potentially at least take us in directions we really need to travel and want to travel. Yeah, you, you describe in your book, uh, uh, and I hadn't come across that word, I have to uh, admit, wicked and super wicked problems. Um, can you explain that a little bit? And maybe you, you give... Uh, an example in the context of the black swan scenarios? Yes, I, I still remember the first time I heard uh, the phrase, I think, uh, uh, wicked problem. And that was in the boardroom of Ford, Ford Motor Company, outside Detroit and Dearborn, right at the beginning of this century. And, and the person who used the phrase, I really liked, but it just struck me as not terribly helpful as a, a term. And I've changed my mind, uh, as one can do. And I've come to the realization took me a while, that wicked problems as a, a, as a category of challenge are distinctive in the sense that uh, they uh, defy attempts to, to uh, solve them. And, and um, in fact, some people now talk about super wicked problems, and, and in that category would put uh, the climate uh, emergency. So these, these are furiously complex uh, challenges. Um, they defy the... Um, the ability or the intent of individual actors like companies uh, or whatever, or even sometimes you know, individual uh, governments to address them. And I think we increasingly face these sorts of problems. So to your question, Uva, I, I think uh, if I had to pick a, a couple of examples, uh, one would be plastics in the ocean. No one intended in the plastics industry to plasticize the oceans, but that's what we've collectively done. Antibiotic resistance is another one. Even Alexander Fleming, one of the pioneers in antibiotic um, production, said that we're going to overuse these things and we're going to get resistance uh, to, to, the, to, to these extraordinary, miraculous products. Why didn't we listen to him? Well, typically as a species, we don't listen to people who can see uh, the future if the future is a bit challenging. So um, there are others, space debris, um, uh, obesity, there are the range of these complex issues now. And the question is, how do we best uh, learn how to tackle them? And you see, I think what, what we humans are struggling with, um, these things usually start small yeah. and suddenly develop in, in a huge speed. And this exponential growth, which we now uh, very, very vividly live through with the pandemic, is something that we, we seem to be not able to put our mind around. Well, that's, that's um, intrinsic to the human brain. It's just not wired. It's, it's wired to track things that are incremental, um, uh, but it's really poorly equipped to understand exponentials. And I, I started to understand that when in 2005, I went to um, California to see uh, one of the founding editors of Wired magazine, Kevin Kelly. Uh, and he was one of the early people into this uh, space of exponential technology and uh, the law of increasing returns, not decreasing returns, and so on. And since then, I've been to again to California to see people like the X Prize Foundation, Singularity University, Google X's um, uh, facility, and I've also, uh, say, in London, been to see people like DeepMind who are working on artificial intelligence. And I think one of my frustrations with the sustainability industry, that in a way I've helped create, is that it's largely focused on things that build relatively slowly um, and the solutions that it's developing had to be um, 
largely non-exponential, but now with things like renewable energy technology, you suddenly see some of these, um, and battery technology and so on, you suddenly see some of these technologies and business models going exponential in a really, really extraordinary and, and, and um, uh, encouraging way. Yeah, you know, I think one of the major uh, uh, theses in, in your book is um, you have to fight uh, negative exponential things with positive ne uh, exponential things. And I think that's what you call a green swan, is it? Well, it's going to be very interesting because when I've come up with earlier um, uh, uh, terms like green consumer or whatever, people have then wanted to slap those terms on almost anything that moved in the market. I think the danger is the same will happen with uh, green swans. But for me, what the, um, the concept means is uh, a solution of some sort. It could be an initiative, it could be a technology, it could be an industry, um, which has got the potential, at least, not, not guaranteed, but the potential to scale uh, exponentially to address uh, problems that are themselves uh, exponential. And I think it just, it, it needs a very different uh, mindset to engage with both those challenges and potentially those solutions. So one of the things I'm kicking myself uh, for is that when I was 14, I gave up most forms of science uh, and mathematics. I should have studied calculus because that is what I'm going to, <laughs> and people like me are going to need next. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's interesting for me because when I was reading your book, I realized uh, a lot of people are talking about that um, growth is is bad and we should go to a zero growth uh, economy and what have you. And what I'm seeing from from you is to say, if I want to combat the the big and we call them super wicked problems that we're facing, we have to have solutions that are capable of growing fast and uh, vigorously to combat these things. And uh, th there is no harm in, in doing that as long as, um, and we talked about this in our last podcast, Gaia, Earth is not suffering from it. Yes, I mean, I, I have great respect for people who argue for no growth or zero growth, but I don't believe it for a moment in terms of its ability, that that agenda to inspire normal people to do extraordinary things. And I think we're at one of those uh, periods in our history where we've all got to step up in uh, new ways, really stretch ourselves. And part of that is going to be, we're going to have to kill certain parts of the industrial spectrum. We're going to have to get rid of coal. We're going to have to get rid of uh, oil sands. Um, the range of industries that are going to have to go to the the wall in the same way that uh, if you look back cfcs or asbestos or you know these sorts of things uh, did but if you're going to do that then you really have got to build uh, the future very fast as well so i think we need exponential decay in some of those old uh, unsustainable industries and we need exponential growth at least for a period uh, in some of the uh, new more sustainable uh, industry sectors and i put renewable energy in that Space, I'd put um, autonomous vehicles potentially in that space if they're used to liberate space in cities so we can use that space for other things. Very often they won't be, but um, that's the political challenge that we face quite alongside the um, technolo technological challenges. Yeah, um, you, you expressed or you called one of your chapters in, in this context um, be a leader, not an algorithm. Yeah. And um, that brings us to the point um, when I'm a leader in a corporation, what does that new requirement that you're putting out there to to nurture green swans mean for corporate leaders? Well, it's funny. Many years ago, uh, in 2008, I wrote a, a previous book called The Power of Unreasonable People. And my co-author was uh, Pamela Hartigan, who then worked uh, with the World Economic uh, Forum. And one of the things, she, and, and she then went on to run the uh, um, the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship at the Side Business School at Oxford, Oxford University. And one of the things she would often say, and at the time I thought it was exaggerated, but the more I, hear, the more I see what's happened since, the more I think it was uh, very much to the point. And what she said was, 
people who are trained to do by you know MBA students, people who go through that process, actually aren't very well equipped either by the the, the very nature of the the sort of human being they might be, or by the skills that they're then given to be entrepreneurial, to be social entrepreneurs, uh, and so on. So one of the things I think uh, we've business and capitalism have been very effective at pushing towards efficiency, uh, squeezing out waste uh, in um, our economies and in our supply chains and in our businesses and so on. And I think we've actually, that's put us in a box. And very often the things that directly contribute to resilience and directly uh, uh, contribute to uh, the regeneration of critical systems aren't particularly efficient. They're wasteful. They're experimental. Stuff happens that doesn't work out. And we've got to work out how to do that new stuff. And unless and until business schools, for example, I have nothing against business schools, but unless and until they actually start to embrace this sort of change agenda, I think they're going to continue to churn out people who are not fit for purpose. Yeah, that uh, that raises a sore point with me where, you know, I had um, some interesting skirmishes with some um, business school professors relatively recently. I mean, it's it's just eight years ago that mm -hmm. uh, where they were still pushing for shareholder value. And uh, the main criteria for success of a business school was entry salary versus uh, exit salary. So I, I think, um, as I said, I, I think we're all interested to see the business roundtable in the United States embracing uh, uh, stakeholder capitalism and saying this is the new thing after uh, shareholder capitalism. I, I, I'm skeptical of that I, in the sense that I think business and capitalism are very much around uh, a return to investors, a return to shareholders and i think i was listening to the economist uh, the editor of the economist earlier on today talking about the way in which what we actually need is to reset sh shareholder capitalism and actually stretch the the views the time scales the horizons of companies and investors to the long term and if we do that then the sort of stakeholder um elements and priorities almost come in um automatically so I, 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 I think language is important. And if we simply say capitalism now has to roll over and be nice to people, I doubt very much that that's going to change the world. Interesting. Um, you, you talk about um, three R's in, in your book, um, responsibility, resilience, and then most importantly, regeneration. How does that, that fit with what we've just discussed about shareholder versus stakeholder and long-term versus short-term? Well, I think the regeneration piece is not uniquely ours at all. Uh, it's it's a concept, it's an agenda which has been building uh, in places like people working on uh, uh, soil health, you know, the Alan Savory Institute, even McDonald's now uh, looking at how you uh, manage uh, soils uh, sustainably. Um, the regeneration agenda has been around for a long time with sort of urban uh, regeneration. I, in fact, I was originally trained to be in the early 70s uh, an urban planner, and my focus was on uh, regeneration. So, in, in some ways, there's nothing new about this. I think the danger is if we expect companies to move directly from responsibility to resilience and regeneration and deliver system level change of that sort, because most companies aren't designed to do that, they're not rewarded to do that. Uh, that increasingly is a public policy and governmental challenge, and it's a political uh, challenge. And I think really what we need to see increasingly is business leaders standing up and calling for system change and not pretending that they can deliver it uh, exclusively on their own with their brand, with their uh, particular organization. They can't, they won't, they need government help to do that. But they also need um, alliances within business, don't they? Totally. And I, I think one of the great achievements of the last sort of 30 plus years has been to see business to business platforms like the uh, World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the U UN Global Compact, the B team and so on popping up. Um, what's interesting is to see someone like Paul Pullman, um, former CEO of Unilever, who's chaired the World Economic Forum, WBCSD, uh, Global Compact, B team, you name it. 
now going to chair the International Chain Chamber of Commerce. And whereas most of the other platforms have a few hundred or perhaps a few thousand members, the International Chamber of Commerce, as we know, has 45 million. And so I, I think now we're getting to the point where rather than having this clusters on the edges and some of these relatively small, well-intentioned platforms, it could potentially go into the mainstream. Uh, whether COVID-19 and the shocks that come with that will actually help or distract in that, I don't want to predict. But I think we can use those shocks in a constructive way if we uh, go about this uh, well. Yeah, that... Uh... That brings me to the point uh, in your book you're using uh, as guidance for uh, corporate leaders um, the f future fit approach. Can you explain a little bit um, what's behind that thinking? Yes, I think future the Future Fit Foundation and the Future Fit Business Benchmark is now embraced by a growing number, still a small number, but of, of uh, pioneering companies, and I think everyone from Novo Nordisk in Denmark to uh, De Beers. And, and the idea is that instead of simply looking at yourself as a company and reporting out on what you do, you're looking at the context within which you um, uh, operate. And now this isn't the first time people have championed this uh, particular approach, but unless we do this and we do it effectively, a lot of what passes for corporate responsibility is really you know, nice to have, but it's not really going to push the, um, the levers uh, of change. And it certainly isn't going to uh, deliver uh, system change. And, and the Future Fit team um, have a wonderful diagram. And I, I reproduce it in the book. And I should just declare an interest. I've been on the advisory board more or less since they uh, started. But, and they do use the triple bottom line as central to what they do. But they have the diagram which shows it starts with an illustration of three uh, unrelated balls or, or circles and, and their sort of business and the economy and their, their society and their environment. And then they have the sort of almost their version of the triple bottom line where these things progressively overlap. And the final one is where the um, economy comes uh, right to the center uh, the society is wrapped around that, and then um, the environment is wrapped around that. So all of these things are intrinsically interlinked and have to be addressed as a, an interconnected uh, system. So I think the future fit, sorry, the future fit uh, approach is potentially very powerful. And I, I hope that once these pioneering companies have, have uh, co-evolved the approach, it could then spread much more widely. Yeah, that um, brings me back to the point you made earlier um, that um, corporations on their own can't do it. But I, I understood in your book you made the point that uh, uh, corporations have to play a bigger role in, in this process uh, towards green swans. Um, but it requires political change. And, um, and you even talk about uh, rebooting democracy. Um, that, that's a bold statement. Uh, how would that come about? <laughs> um, well, entrepreneurs and, and, and change makers, troublemakers, if you like, uh, have throughout history uh, protested about the dysfunctions of, of democracy or capitalism or whatever it was. Um, and over time, you know, and with the ab abolition of slavery or the the, um, the painting of the so-called plimsoll line on, on, on uh, cargo ships, it took decades, even generations, for these changes to come through. We don't have that time scale now. So um, I'm not saying to companies don't act, and I'm looking out uh, around the world and I'm seeing uh, companies, and most conspicuously perhaps in recent years, Tesla, uh, you know, uh, with Elon Musk uh, at its helm, um, that's been such a disruptive uh, influence upon the automotive uh, industry. I mentioned earlier on working with Ford back in the day. and. You know, that whole electric vehicle and um, uh, the whole uh, autonomous vehicle uh, proposition that rides on top of that is so, so disruptive. And if used in the right way, could be a massive shift or involve a massive shift uh, towards more sustainable forms of access, mobility, transport, uh, and so on. So these things are already happening. 
And as I, I, I heard once uh, somebody say, um, uh, something's probably not impossible if it already exists. And so part of our uh, uh, challenge now is to just show where these things actually do exist and they're, uh, they're operating so far too small a scale. They need to scale. Um, but that's always the, the problem when you've got these potentially disruptive things. There are people who have a vested interest in stopping them. Yeah, that's. Um, I, I think what you what you're saying is that um, really these disruptive um, entrepreneurs have to drive um, the agenda, and um, and uh, we have seen uh, with these ideas of uh, factor ten uh, x and a hundred x that um, there are ways of doing that, and you just given an example, so. That's uh, that's the way you, you're seeing that we move also the political systems because we see, of course, that all your green swans uh, might have, and you you call it, they could have black feathers. Yeah, so um, we have to be aware of that, don't we? Well, also black swans can ca have green feathers. I mean, we look at this COVID-19 disaster, a catastrophe, really. But at the same time, you see... Uh, urban air clearing, where in India they can now see the Himalayas where, in the ways that they haven't done for uh, decades. And, and there are benefits of some of the collapses in economic activity that we see. In the same way, uh, for example, if you take the, the case of uh, renewable energy and windmills, uh, we're suddenly finding we don't know what the hell to do with the windmill rotors, uh, the propellers, uh, in effect. Um, when they come to the end of their useful life. And these things are piling up now in uh, landfill sites. Uh, we really should have thought about how we uh, adopt uh, a, a circular model, close the loop on, on the components of a, an industry like that. But not, very often we leave it until we're uh, forced to do that. My hope is uh, that as a species, over time, we can become very much better at thinking in circularity terms, in sustainability terms. Um, but by God, it's taking uh, quite a while to uh, get there. But I think the wider world is starting to signal that it's make or break. We have to do this in uh, historically very short order now, or it becomes a truly existential crisis for our civilization. Thank you. That's uh, that's a great uh, summary. And I, I must say, that for me, your book, um, even so, it wasn't written at all with uh, COVID-19 in mind. It, it is that light at the end of the tunnel of COVID-19. It shows a way forward um, uh, uh, and how to approach um, the, and let's come back to the word, super wicked problems of, mm. of our time. And um, uh, I, I said it before, I, I think it's really encouraging. You know, we, both of us are... Um, around the 70s now of age and you wrote in your book um, you're looking forward to the next 15 years the most exciting uh, uh, times in, in in your life and and big changes ahead so thank you very much uh, for sharing these um, engaging perspectives and um, and we were only able to scratch the surface of that book I strongly recommend to read it it's uh, full of uh, examples and references and uh, it has even a guide uh, how to spot green swans in there so um thank you thank you john so much we we only touched uh, on the un sustainable development goals in the last two podcasts very briefly in the next podcast i will be talking to marcia badistiano from Re uh, from relics about the un sdgs and what they can offer for business so thank you john and uh, looking forward uh, to a continued conversation about this um, challenging new uh, world after COVID-19. And thank you, Uwe, and thank you very much to the conference board as well for making this possible. Thank you so much. And uh, to our listeners, if you've enjoyed this episode, please remember to subscribe to our podcast series or explore the entire catalogue of podcasts programming from the conference board by visiting our website, at tcb.org slash podcast. Thank you and goodbye. That was Let's Talk Sustainable Business.